right, I have the pleasure of preaching God's word to you this morning. My name is Scott, for those of you who I haven't met. I'm married to Amy, and we've got two little champions in Life Kids, and the third one on the way. Uh, we've got another one coming next year, Valentine's Day, another little boy key, Timothy is his name, so we're very, very excited about that. Um, some of you may not know, but I used to work and live up in Johannesburg. I know, it's a tough, tough stint I did up there, um, and I was doing consulting work at the time for, for some of the mines in the area. There's a lot of mining up north, um, and on my way into work every morning, I would, I would listen to the news. I would listen to an update of what's going on in the world, any big breaking news, any big stories that were going on, and I remember listening each morning to this developing story. There was a story about some social unrest that was, that was busy, busy brewing at one of the mines in the northwest. And I remember hearing about there were some demands being made by all the employees. The employer wasn't meeting those demands, and things were, things were escalating. And every morning I drove in to work, I heard about the story that was slowly busy picking up speed and picking up momentum. And the strike went on day after day after day after day. Eventually a month had passed, and the strike was still going on. And labor was becoming stronger, the, the, everyone was gathering around, everybody's friends were coming to say, these are our demands, and they need to be met. And the employer at that time was saying, we, we won't meet those demands, we refuse to meet those demands. The police were getting involved, things were escalating. And I remember too the day, I remember exactly what I was wearing, I remember where I was sitting, I remember who I was sitting next to, when the news broke about the Maracana massacre. I remember the day when police opened fire on strikers and killed 37 people on that day. I just, I remember it so clearly. It was a, it was a day when that town was transformed. It was changed. It was never, never to be the same again. That industry was changed. Forever, the relationship between employees and employer would be scarred and there would be mistrust. On that moment, there was a transformative event that changed that city. And I wonder if you had to look back in your own life and some of the memories that you have of what were those transformative events that changed the city or the town that you were in? A transformative event. Thinking back, 9-11. I don't know how many of you remember 9-11. I remember where I was. I remember watching the news about one plane that had crashed into the World Trade Center. I was watching on one of those small TVs with a big, with a big thing on the back, one of those big bubbles on the back. And I was watching, and as I was watching the news, the second plane flew into the World Trade Center. I, just, I remember that day so clearly because I knew that in that moment, New York City would never be the same, and our world, I think, would never be the same again. Maybe the day that Nelson Mandela got freed from prison. Yeah, I mean, some of us would be a bit young for that, but I'm sure there would have been excitement. What is that day for you, that transformative event? Maybe it's when South Africa won the 2023 World Cup and beat New Zealand in the final. <laughs> hey, maybe it's that day. Who knows? Too soon, too soon, too soon. But a, a, a transformative event is, is something that changes, it changes the fabric of a city. It changes the very ethos of the city, changes the culture of a city. And a revolution is exactly that. It's defined as a transformative event that changes the course of a city, of a nation, or even the world. Because cha change is hard. Change for a city is difficult. And you actually need a revolution to change a city. It's not going to happen by accident. It's going to ha happen when there's a revolution, when there's a transformative event that changes our city. And we've been busy with a preaching series called We the Church. We the Church. And that's, it's been about what does it look like to be the church in our city? What does it look like to be the church in our city? And this morning, I want to preach on how to change a city. How do you, how do you change a city? It's one thing being a church. It's one thing being a group of believers. But how do you actually change a city? Because if I think about my own life, I don't dream about having lots of money, genuinely. I don't dream about being famous. Okay, maybe that one a little bit, but not, not all the time. But, but I dream about being part of a revolution. I dream about being part of a social movement that changes a city, that changes a city, that changes the social fabric of a city. That's what I dream about, is being part of something so remarkable, so crazy, so absurd, 
that a city is turned on its head through what I was a part of. And how do we do that? So let's, let's jump in. We're going to ask that this morning. Let's pray. Jesus, we pray you'd be with us. Would you change us this morning? Would you shape us? We open our hearts, our eyes, our ears to your word, Lord. Would you shake us this morning in Jesus' precious name? Amen, amen. Let's turn in our Bibles to Acts 19. And while you turn there, this is a text about Paul's ministry in Ephesus. Paul is ministering in Ephesus. You can turn by your Bible. Well done, Fee, for bringing the hard copy. Anybody else? I see some other hard copies here in the front row. Good job. But use your phone. You're welcome to turn. You can look at the screen behind me. And let's read the text together. It says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that when the handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some itinerant Jewish exorcists, itinerant I didn't know what that meant. I was going to ask Aiden, but I just Googled it. And basically what it means, roaming, just roaming guys. They were, they were cruising around, going from city to city, tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. The seven sons of Jewish high priests named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit said to them in the reply, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered them, and so overpowered them that they fled from the house naked and wounded. When this became known to all residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, everyone was awestruck, and the name of the Lord was praised. Also, many of those who became believers confessed and disclosed their practices. A number of those who practiced magic collected their books and burned them publicly. When the value of these books was calculated, it was found to be 50,000 silver coins. So the word of the law grew mightily and prevailed. There's a lot lot going on there. We've got handkerchiefs. For those of you who don't know what a handkerchief is, um, it's basically a, a piece of cloth that you put in your pocket in the morning, and then you blow your nose with it, and then you put it back in your pocket, and then after a while... You take it out of your pocket again and blow your nose into that same hanky. It's like a germ fest in, in your pocket, basically. For those of you who don't know, my granddad used to have one. I was always so gross. But anyway, these hankies were on fire at that time. We've got the sons of Sceva who were basically running around, get, got beaten by a man that was possessed and ran out of the town beaten and naked. That's, that's the text. That's what it said. And all of the believers also coming together and making one big fire in the city center and burning a whole bunch of stuff. There's a lot going on here. But that passage that I read, it lands with this sentence. It says, so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Grew mightily and prevailed. We're talking about a city of Ephesus. And if I describe Ephesus to you, it's going to sound a lot like somewhere that all of you would know. Ephesus was a lot like Cape Town, in all honesty. The, the challenges of those days, the, the, the things that they were wrestling with in that city is a lot like what the challenges of Cape Town. They were, they were manic about money. They were manic about making money and holding on to the money that they made. They would do anything to get rich and to stay rich. They were all about a city of indulgence. Good food, good wine, all indulgences and pleasure that you could imagine were on offer to you. There was very little talk of consequences. If you felt like it, you go do it. In whatever way that you could imagine, it was a city of indulgence. It was a city of, of worship, that there was people would worship whatever God that they saw fit. There were literally thousands of gods that were on offer. And whatever your preference was, or whatever you felt like aligned with your belief and your, your current theology, you could go and worship that God. Sound familiar? And yet in in the city of Ephesus, there was a church, a church probably not too dissimilar to Life Changes Century City. And commentators speak about that church as being the hub of Christianity for all of Asia. A small church in the town of Ephesus was so instrumental in the spreading of God's word that they call it the hub of Christianity for an entire continent. Imagine that. Imagine life changes. Century City gets described as the hub of Christianity for all of Africa. Imagine that, eh? How cool is that to have a title that God is doing something so profound with a little church in the city of Ephesus that God's word was spread throughout 
an entire continent. And that gets me excited. It was through that church that the city of Ephesus was changed. There was a revolution. And we're looking this morning at what that meant. How did they do it? How did a small church of believers that were committed to the Lord and the preaching of his word turn a city on its head? Because that's something that I want to be a part of. And if I look at the text, I think that there are two steps to cause a revolution. There are two steps to cause a revolution. If you read from Acts 19, verse 8 to 10, it says, He entered, this is Paul, entered the synagogue, and for three months he spoke out boldly and argued pervasively persuasively about the kingdom of God. When some stubbornly refused to believe and spoke evil of the way before the congregation, he left them, taking the disciples with him and argued daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Paul comes into Ephesus and for two years, for two years, he preaches he preaches, he speaks God's word in a setting like this would be, would be probably one type of forum that he would speak. He spoke it in the town halls, he spoke it in public gatherings, he spoke it in such a way that everybody in that region heard the word of the Lord. And what it says too is that there was resistance to, to what, what he was saying, some people believed, others didn't, but he continued to faithfully preach God's word. He continued to preach God's word. And as he did this, people came to know the Lord and things, things started happening in the city. You just imagine as I, as I drove into work and I just, you can hear that there's rumblings of, of a movement. There's something happening and that would have been the case too in that town. There would be rumblings of a movement. There's miracles happening. There's people that are coming to know Jesus. There's miracles. People are getting healed. People are getting filled with the Spirit. And Paul continues to preach God's word. He continues to preach Christ as the only authority, Jesus as the only one who saves. If we read the book that Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, the book of Ephesians, it's split in two halves. There's chapters one to six. And the first half, chapters one to three, is about exactly that. It's about Jesus as the one who saves us into God's family, as Jesus our only authority over heaven and earth the one that we bow, our, we bow down to, that is Jesus over all. And Paul is preaching. Paul's doing his thing. Paul's convicted. He knows exactly what he's saying. And then these sons of Sceva, these Romans, they come in. And they would be familiar with worship. Worship was a common practice in that city. And their thinking was, how can we use what Paul is preaching, how can we use the name of Jesus for our own benefit? How can we manipulate the name of Jesus for our benefit? This is a cool party trick. This is one of 5,000 other gods that we have access to, the name of Jesus. And they go to a demon-possessed man and they say to him, they try and cast out that demon, the name of Jesus. And the demon responds rightfully because he knows about authority. He says, Paul I know and Jesus I know, but who are you? And it's just, there's this revelation in that moment from them as they get beaten and thrown out naked out of the city, there's a revelation of Jesus Christ in that moment, the authority of Jesus Christ. And it says this in Acts 19, verse 17. It says, when this became known to all residents in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, everyone was awestruck, and the name of the Lord Jesus was praised. It's just there's this, there's this moment of revelation with the church as these sons of Sceva are getting kicked out of town to realize that Jesus has the authority of all. That it's not about some party trick, it's not about something, another God that we can serve, it's that Jesus Christ has the final say. Jesus Christ has the final authority in our lives. And that's an incredibly profound moment. Step one for revolution, in my understanding of this text, is a revelation of Jesus Christ. A revelation of of Jesus Christ. And then we go on to step two. It says, Acts 19, verse 18 and 20. It says, also, many of those who became believers confessed and disclosed their practices. A number of those who practiced magic collected their books and burned them publicly. And when the value of these books was collected, it came to 50,000 silver coins. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. And actually, if we look at the story, there was this bubbling in the city there was things moving, there were things shaking, there were things that were, were on the go, 
But it wasn't until this final step, step two, that there was a, revol a revolution in that city. A revolution. And you know what that trigger was? It was as people were so awestruck by Jesus, so understood his rule and reign over their lives, that sunk in so deep, so, a so sense of conviction. You know what they did? They went home, they kicked down all the doors, and they took all of the lesser things into the city center, into the light, and they burned them in a fire there. All of the idols, all of their magic books, all of their everything else that wasn't under the authority and the lordship of Jesus Christ, they brought those things out of the woodwork into the city center, and they burnt it. And if we look at this text, the moment that revolution started in that city, the moment that there was an uproar, that there was protests, that there was, the city was, cha was changed, it was the moment that they brought those magic books and those idols into the city center and they burnt them. I ran the Cape Town Marathon last week. No, correction, I, I ran the first half and I walked the second half of the Cape Town Marathon <laughs> last week. And when we were going through, um, through one of the parts, there was, there was protest action in one of, one, of the, one of the areas of our city. And it was probably 150, 200 people that got together and felt like we need to protest. We need to wake up early on a Sunday morning. We need to get dressed up. We need to make boards. We need a loud halo. And we are going to protest. Some people felt strongly enough to protest something on a Sunday morning when they could be doing something else. And a protest can be quite a scary thing as people gather around to voice an issue, to voice a concern, to voice their view on something. And scholars and the theologians about this text, they estimate that the protest that was caused from the church burning those idols, there was a protest of 200,000 people that gathered in protest. If you look at the screen behind me, there's a photo of what it looks like for 200,000 people protesting in a city center. Huh? This is what the protest would have looked like as this church got together and burned some idols got together and responded to the revelation of Jesus Christ in their lives. Because if we look at the book of Ephesians, it's so beautifully written. Chapters 1, verse 3, um, the commentators say it's, it's written as though from the stars. It's written, it's written up here. Paul, Paul writes up here. And chapters 4, verse 6, it's written in the dirt. It's written in the dirt. It's basically saying, so you have a revelation of Jesus. As you receive that revelation in 1 verse 3, it's split by one word. It says, therefore, therefore, live a life worthy of the call that you've been called to. It goes on to say, live a life as children of the light. And basically, chapters 4 verse 6 is exactly that. It's saying, how do we live a life worthy of the call? Of the call. As we have a revelation of Jesus Christ, what does that life look like? And that's exactly what this church in Ephesus did. They were able to have a revelation of Jesus in their life and then to go into their homes and to practice it. To practice it. And that, I believe, is what causes a revolution. A realization of what Jesus has done for each of us and then going and putting that into practice in each of our lives, kicking down those doors, kicking down every area that is not under the lordship of Jesus Christ and bringing that under his rule and reign, creating a fire in the city and bringing those things and burning them, burning them, not negotiating with them, not managing them, not trying to compartmentalize them like we try to compartmentalize Jesus in other areas of our life. If we want a revolution in our city, we put Jesus above it all and we burn the rest. We burn the rest. And if I dream about my life when Amy and I are 85 and watching Blue Bloods on a Saturday night because Tom Selleck will still be alive and we pick up that remote and we're too old to pick it up, if, if I... If I look at my life and where I want to be when I'm that age, I want to look back and I want to tell stories about a revolution. I want to tell stories about this church, Life Changes Century City, when we did something so dramatic 
that we had 200,000 people protesting against life change at Century City. Imagine that. Imagine how, comf- imagine how comfortable that would be. Hey, imagine, but that's, that's how you change a city. You change a city through radical obedience to what God has called us to. And that gets me excited. And what, what, what does that look like? And as I say these things, step one and step two, revelation of Jesus and burning the idols, sometimes it can be difficult to, to translate that into our practical lives, into, okay, what does that mean for me now when I walk out that door? And I want to just give you practical, real examples that I have seen and in my own life of what it means to have a revelation of Jesus and what it means to burn those idols. We got invited to a breakfast a few weeks back where, where very close friends of ours were celebrating their, their 10-year wedding anniversary. They invited some close friends, it was family, and with celebration of 10 years of marriage. It was, it, was a great, it was a great place to be on a Friday morning when most people are working. We were having breakfast, but it was a wonderful place to be. And they went through the normal thing of confessing their love for each other and all those nice things. But actually, the thing that struck me that morning was a declaration of the authority and the rule of Jesus Christ over their lives. That was the beautiful thing, that if we talk about a revelation of Jesus Christ as our authority, I just, I just felt like sitting in that moment, we just, it's like the lights went on, that they've had a revelation of Jesus over their lives. And how, and how did they get to that point? We have had the, we've had the privilege of journeying with them, and they've been in our community for a number of years, giving, sowing, remaining committed to the preaching of God's word, remaining committed to saying, we will hear God's word continually. We will sit on a Sunday service. We will listen to God's preach. We will get involved in a life group. We will hear what God has to say, flesh that out together. We will commit to remaining involved in our community and stay plugged in. Because for any of you that have been in church for longer than six months will know there are exits along the way. There are exits. We don't, we're not going to, if you decide to leave, we're not going to run after you and try and catch you and say, whoa, 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 are you sure, are you sure? We all here of our own accord. And if you stay in this community long enough, somebody's going to say something you don't like. Gabe's going to offend you on some level. There's going to be, an, there's, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen and you will have an opportunity to exit. But just the beauty of that Friday morning was seeing a couple that had dedicated themselves to the preaching of God's word, and through that, there was revelation. There was revelation about Jesus Christ. And the truth is, we don't need to do that on our own. John 14, verse 26, it says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit comes alongside us to reveal to us Jesus, to reveal him to us so that we can have that revelation of Jesus Christ in our life. Step one for revolution is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And step two, it's going and getting the idols and bringing them out into the light. And for me, if I look at my own life, in high school I was was living a parallel life. I was living two lives. I was Scott on a Friday night at youth, doing his thing, a youth leader, the pastor's child, all, all that you can imagine. The, the, the golden boy, as they called me, of the time. No, no I'm joking. They didn't call me that. But, <laughs> but I was involved in my youth on a Friday night. Let's leave it at that. But, um, but then on a Saturday night, my life looked very different. My life looked very, very different. From a Friday night to Saturday night, I was a different person. And this came to a head at my 21st birthday party, where I decided I would invite both group of friends to the same party. (laughs) Schoolboy era. (laughs) My parents were there also, so I had both groups of friends and my parents, all in a confined space. (laughs) And I also asked a representative from each group to say a speech about me. As, as, as one does at the 21st. The, the Friday night crew got up, oh, it was very special, talking about me and all of the good things and the attributes that I had. And then the other group of friends got up and told a completely different story of who I was. And I just remember in that moment, it felt like they were talking about two different people. 
My dad looked at me and shook his head. My mom cried. And it was a tough night. <laughs> no, it was. It really was. All my Christian friends went to bed early. All my other friends woke up in the kitchen half drunk in the morning at four o'clock. And there was this clash of wills as I was caught in the middle of living a double life. It's, it's the truth of it. And that came to a head with the revelation of Jesus in my life. I had to make a change. And it was a change that, co that cost me something. There was two friends who I love dearly, and we've got memories for days, and I have the best time when I'm with them. But I just knew at that, at that 21st party, I knew I can't keep doing what I'm doing. And those relationships, those friendships, I had to literally take them into the city center, put some paraffin on, set them alight, and watch them burn. I had to say goodbye to two friends that I had invested a lot with, we had shared a lot of memories, but I just, I just knew, and it was right for me, I knew that if I was gonna be called into all that God had for me, that could not continue the way it was. And if they estimate the, the, the church in Ephesus, all those idols and all what they brought in their house, it was worth over a million rand what they brought into the city center that day. It cost them something, it cost them something. And those relationships, those friendships that I invested in, I just, I knew it was right for me. You would have your own, your own idols to bring into the city center. But I knew it was right for me that those needed to be burnt. And I think that's how we start a revolution. It's through obedience to God in every single, every single area of our life. Not in the selected areas that we choose to bring into the light. It's in every single area of our life. And as we do that, I genuinely believe we can turn the city on its head. Let's stand. I would like to pray for us this morning. I'd like to pray for us. Because I think as I, as I speak to you this morning, maybe, maybe you're just so desperate for a revelation of Jesus. You just feel like there's, just, there's so much noise in your head. There's so many competing priorities. I don't even know. I don't even know how to, how to get through the week. And now you're talking about a revelation of Jesus. I want to pray this morning for us that there will be a revelation of Jesus in each of our lives. And I want to pray too for courage. I want to pray for courage because, you know what, it sucks. Having those conversations with people you love and people you care about and people that you know you need to make a change in your life and do something different, it sucks. And it costs something to you and it costs something to them. And it's hard. And when you watch those things burn in the city center, and watch them really burn. Not being managed, not being put in a compartment, not being closed in a back door for something for later. When you watch those things really burn, it hurts. But you know what the reality is? Is that my life would not be in the same place it is today if I didn't set those things alight. And I would be not be married to Amy, I would not have the kids that I do, I would not be in the position that I am, I would not be where I am today if I didn't properly set those things alight. And I want to pray for courage this morning because it's hard and it's not easy. But I think if we want to see a revolution, I think we need to have the courage to make those calls. So Jesus, I lift up each and every person this morning and I pray firstly for a revelation of Jesus. Jesus, would you come and reveal yourself to each person. As the Holy Spirit comes and reveals Jesus to each person with the authority and the rule and the reign on each person's life, that you are above it all, would that drop deep within them? As it says in the text, that we would be awestruck, Jesus. We'd be awestruck with you and worship you, our King. And I pray too that as we reach that revelation, as it sinks within us, as it goes deep within our soul, that we would be able to come out of that and live as children of the light. Bring out those idols. Bring out those magic books. Bring out whatever is hiding in the work work. Bring that out into the light and set fire to all that is not under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in your precious and holy name. Amen.